flight. Uh, it has all of our, the names of my crew members uh, around it. And uh, this is where we were going to the Hubble Space Telescope, 350 miles above the Earth. That's what it looked like when we got there. I'll tell you a little bit about my crew. This uh, picture was taken down at the Kennedy Space Center. We were practicing some emergency egress drills, driving an Army personnel carrier. Oh, we'll get training to, to drive this thing just in case we have to get away from the shuttle safely, and this is the way we would do it. Uh, the person driving is Megan MacArthur. She's an oceanographer, uh, and she uh, was a bit younger than the six other guys, me included, in the back. So when people would ask her what it was like to fly in space with, with the six of us, she would say it was like going to space with her six older brothers. Because we were significantly older, we were all about the same age, maybe a bit younger, and, and when the camera wasn't on, she would stay with her six annoying older brothers. <laughs> so, um, so that's Megan driving, and then in the back on the left there is uh, John Grunsfeld, and uh, he was uh, our lead spacewalker. I think this was actually his third trip to Hubble, and I want to use my pointer here. So that's Megan, we already met her. This is John. He was our lead spacewalker. This was his third trip to Hubble, his fifth space flight overall, and he was uh, our, our lead for those spacewalks. And that he was, you know, that was his primary function to make sure we were all doing our job. We had two teams. I was that's me there. I was the lead guy for the second team, and I was paired with Mike Good. That is, uh, he's right there. This is his first space flight. John and I had flown previously on SPS 109 together. This is our second time together in space. Uh, the, the guy down here, this is Greg Johnson, who's a Navy pilot. He was the pilot on flight. He was uh, uh, making his first space flight. This fellow over here is Drew Foisel. He was matched up with John. He was his John's space force partner. He was also Drew's first flight. And then the big guy back here is Scott Altman. He, John, and I had flown together in space on SPS-109. And he, again, was our, he was our commander on that flight. He was the commander for, for 125. His claim to fame is that... Uh, in addition to being you know, a shuttle commander and all that, was that when he was in the Navy, when he was flying uh, in San Diego, they were filming the movie Top Gun. Have you ever seen that movie? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Only one. one little kid <laughs> <laughs> all right. He's the real Tom Cruise. He flew all the scenes for Tom Cruise, put the helmet mm. on, and, and all that stuff, and he's in the credits. And whenever, whenever he was grumpy, I would just ask him questions about what was it like to fly in the movie Top Gun. And immediately he'd get back in the credits. <laughs> Uh, we did a lot of training together. We trained for two and a half years. It wasn't supposed to be that long, but we were really slow learners. <laughs> we got delayed. Uh, we were, we were, at one point, we were like two weeks away from launch back in September of uh, 08. And uh, a computer on the telescope failed, and it delayed our launch until May of 09. So we were together for a very long time. Training, relatively speaking, for a shuttle flight. It was supposed to be about a year and a half. It ended up being more like uh, over two and a half years. Anyway, uh, we did a lot of training in the water. That's me getting ready to go into the water tank. Uh, a lot of practice for our spacewalks was done underwater and in other facilities as well, such as this facility. And I, I show you this to set up a story that you're going to um, tell you about later. Um, one of the things I did on the flight that we, we did, and I was the, my job was to actually perform this repair was to repair an instrument that had failed. Uh, it was a spectrometer that had failed, had a power supply failure, and we did not have a replacement for it. Normally what we do on, on Hubble was, you know, something's not working, you replace the whole unit and put a whole new one in. It's like, you know, the, the light bulb goes out on the refrigerator, we don't replace the light bulb, we get throw out the refrigerator and get a new one, that's kind of the way it works. And so we didn't have a replacement for this thing, but they really wanted this instrument to come back online. It was. You know, I hate, I, you know, looking, I'm very nervous about saying uh, astronomy facts in this audience. <laughs> I know everything I tell, I hear about it come wrong, but I'll just go ahead and say it anyway. My, the, the spectrometer was, was really good at detecting the atmospheres of far off planets. And so they were excited about using this thing to hopefully discover maybe another Earth like planet out there somewhere. And it went and failed, uh, and they wanted to bring it back to life, so, so we had this plan to remove an access panel. This was never expected to be done in space. To remove an access panel that has 117 very small screws. Oh. And, uh, and you take out you know, something that was missing. Now, this stuff is meant to launch into space. No one's supposed to take it apart. I mean, they really want the stuff to be solid. So, after we got all that, those screws off, hopefully, we had this. So, the way we're going to do that was this, this capture panel that you see there, this blue and with the red. So, 
circles. That's a panel that I, was, I had to attach first to the instrument, remove all those screws by using that drill. And the holes were small enough so that it would capture the screw couldn't float out, but I could fit the tool head through it. And then remove the whole plate. We had to cut some wires, look for the gasket. Then we had to take these other screws out to remove the board and then replace it with a new board. And we didn't have to put the screws back. They gave us a new a new cover that just snapped into place, more or less. But uh, anyway, the reason I'm telling you all this is that you'll see later in the film a problem we had with it. Out of all these 117 uh, fasteners, there were two big ones for a handrail that was right here. Now, in this picture, I've already removed the handrail while I was practicing and put the plate on it. Before I could do anything, I had to get this handrail. It was a handrail here. It goes from this stanchion down to a stanchion that looks just the same down here. And there were some big bolts in here and down here that were no problem during training, but you'll see what happens on orbit. So I'm just pointing out what we'll talk about that later. Um, this picture shows two space shuttles on the launch pad. Uh, when they camp, they actually canceled our mission after the Columbia accident because when it, we normally, most of our flights with the space shuttle and even the, the next couple we're finishing up the program with go to the International Space Station. So if you find out that you got a problem with your spaceship, you can hang around on the space station for a long time until you can figure out a way to get you home. With Hubble, there's nobody there. And if there was, it'd be worse. That looks mean. <laughs> so so there, you know, we have no way to live there. So uh, you're stuck. If your spaceship is bad, then you're, you know, you're in trouble. So they decided they were going to have a, a rescue launch uh, spaceship, another shuttle ready to go with a crew that went into quarantine and were going to come rescue us. So, of course, we were very nice to these guys <laughs> because they were going to come get us. But so this is why kind of a, uh, you know, an interesting photo because it's, the last time we've ever had two shuttles on the launch pad, uh, you know, ready to go. This launch pad actually is trying to get torn down. The pad itself we'll be using it, but the whole structure to support the shuttle is now being taken down. So we, we won't even have this. We don't even have the structure anymore. But here we have two shuttles ready to go for our launch. It was kind of a unique situation. And here's some video of the launch. <laughs>
So uh, the feeling I had, my first flight, I don't even remember really what was going on. I think I was praying so much. I didn't know. <laughs> my second flight, I really wanted to make a point of trying to pay attention. And uh, the only thing that I, I, I felt like, I felt like uh, something had grabbed me, like some beast from one of these movies that you know, my son watches, you know, with a big, some giant prehistoric creature had grabbed me and was taking me somewhere very fast, and just in a matter of seconds, I was further from home than I ever was before. And it's, it's just uh, the two words that I, that I kept thinking was speed and power. Speed and power. That's, that's all I felt. Those are the two, the two things to describe how I felt. It was just this enormous, powerful beast had us and was taking us far away. And hopefully it knew what it was doing because we weren't going to be able to stop it. Uh, it was the sensation I had. So anyway, that was our, uh, our launch. And uh, we rendezvoused with the telescope and grabbed it on our third day in space, put it in payload bay, and then started spacewalking. This is a picture from our first spacewalk. John is on the right, Drew is on the arm on the left. I was inside working the checklist with him, kind of keeping him on track, telling him what we needed to do. Uh, this is the wide field camera. This is actually, this is after they put the new one in. But the wide field camera that we installed uh, increases the ability of Hubble to see in the visible spectrum by about a factor of 10. It's got all the, you can think of how, how you know, the camera, am I wrong, Wolfgang? I can move the Wolfgang, I'm afraid of what Oh, well, if you think of how the, uh, the you know, I guess I, I can get away with saying whatever I want, but it's very hard. <laughs> I've got it right there. Just give me a, throw something up if I should. So if you think about your digital cameras or where they, how they've advanced over the years and how much you can have now on your phone, you have more pixels than when you had 20 years ago on a big camera, right? Or just a few years ago on a big camera. Uh, all that technology has been able to be put into the telescope. So all this great digital technology has been been shoved into the, into the instruments. And, and that's the good thing about being delayed is that they can continually upgrade things uh, to make it as, as, new, as powerful as possible. So anyway, that was when, this is after we got the old one out. This is the old one going back in, and the new one has already been put in. We had trouble on this first, right off the bat with this first spacewalk. Drew was on the arm. And his job was to loosen this one bolt that keeps that instrument in there. Sounds easy, right? Just turn the wrench and the bolt comes out. But what happened was, is a, uh, you don't want to over torque this bolt, so we have a torque limiter on the wrench. So it slipped. The, the, you know, he, was, he was taking too much torque. He didn't have enough torque in his wrench. So we told him to reset his, his torque limiter, and he tried that, and it still was slipping. He couldn't loosen the bolt that was in too tight, apparently. So uh, we went and we got an extra, a different torque limiter and even raised it higher. And that slipped. So what he had to do was he had to take off the limiter and just use a straight wrench, which means that he had to try to limit the amount of torque he was putting in there. And if he went and put too much in, he would snap the drive rod. Because what you don't want is you don't want to have a situation where you can't get the, 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 the instrument back. You can't have a hole in the telescope. So they'd rather have an old instrument in there, even if it doesn't do anything, than have a hole, which destroys the whole thing. So... So here he's on his first spacewalk, his first space flight, and he's like, okay, see, it's up to you, Drew, to save astronomy. So, <laughs> he's he's, he's, luckily, he's a very good mechanic. He works on his own cars and works on anything that I have that breaks, I bring it to his house. But he did a, did a great job in, in getting that instrument out and uh, putting a new one in. Uh, this is a uh, scene from, my, uh, from our second spacewalk, which was my first one for the mission. That's me with my head down looking at something on the right, and that's my good upside down, my, my spacewalking partner. In his hand is a gyroscope. Um, the gyroscopes, we were talking about this earlier, there's really, I think, two things that makes Hubble a great telescope. One is the optics. It's got these, you know, these great optics. They're located above the atmosphere. It can see the universe very clearly and take these incredible images. But the only way to take those images is if you can point the telescope and hold it at the part of the sky you're looking at very precisely over time so we can get that image. And the way it's able to hold that gaze very precisely as it's traveling 17,500 miles an hour to keep tracking or with these gyroscopes to keep its guidance going. And they're so accurate, the, uh, the way we de describe it is that if you had a, and I'm from the East Coast, so I don't have, really have a Texas analogy for this, but if you're in the Empire State Building in my hometown, you know, you're over there in New York City, pointing a laser at, uh, at Washington, and someone had a, a dime on the Washington Monument, you could hit that dime on the Washington Monument with a laser being pointed from the Empire State Building. So these things can, can point to the mm -hmm. telescope very accurately. 
Um, the story I have from this is that we had trouble with these with these uh, gyroscopes going in. One of them wasn't fit right, fitting right, and we had to go back and get a backup. But one thing I had done on that spacewalk was I had fetched a cable that I was going to install on an instrument as a get-ahead for my friends the next day, trying to do my friends a favor. Because uh, they were in another part of the telescope the next day with Hard 3. So I was going to help them out by, by hooking up this cable for them. And it was just on a hook, this one cable, and I was going to go right into the telescope and put it in. But we had trouble with these gyroscopes, so I had to go back and transfer and translate around and get, the, get a new one and see if that one was going to work. And we were all over the place. Well, somehow, through all this translating that I unexpectedly was doing, I must have hit the hook. And everything has to be tethered because it all floats and things will go. If, as soon as they become, they'll just, they'll just disappear from you. You never get them. So this very valuable cable, which we only had one of, uh, was, was on me. And it hooked somehow. And I'm, I'm on the end of the telescope. And all of a sudden, I said, like, you, know, you, you, like you see something? It's like, no, nah, I can't be. I can't be <laughs> and I see this thing floating away. I'm like, no. Nah. And, I, and, I, and, and the two thoughts that went through my mind was, one, we only have one of those. <laughs> and the second one is, I saw like the headlines of how how I, said, I had personally killed the son. You know, I was just seeing the cable, but I was seeing the, only, the future of your work, old gang, was floating away from me at that time. But I quickly went and grabbed it and, and was able to, to save it and hook it up. So anyway, that was our, that was the second spacewalk from the mission. Uh, and we ended up with a total of five. Uh, I show you this picture, uh, just taking a thing from the last one, but um, you can see that's the Earth in the background, right? And you can see the darkness, and then you see the light coming, and you can see that line that dictates, you know, the nighttime and, and day, right? So here we are, it's, it's dark out. When you're over the dark part of the Earth where the sun isn't uh, shining on you, uh, like 180 degrees from where we are right now, on the other side of the Earth, it's, it's nighttime. If you're in space, it's really dark. The darkest thing I've ever experienced, like you're the, the absence of light is completely dark. You do have some lights in the payload bay, you have helmet lights where you can light up an area right in front of you, but around you it's pure blackness. And it's cold out there. It can be a couple hundred degrees below zero. When you get to the sunlight, it's the brightest experience I've ever had, spacewalking in the sun. It is, it is pure white light. It is just a pure light that's beating down on you. And the temperature, if you have an outside thermometer, you don't feel it in your space suit, so you're fairly comfortable, but it can go as high as 200 degrees. Uh, above zero, so you have this huge, this huge variation between night and, and dark, night and night and day, where it's you know, heat and it's light and it's just a completely different experience. And because you're going around the Earth so quickly, every 45 minutes you get a sunrise and a sunset. So uh, it, you, you're whipping around 90, 90 minutes for one orbit, so you get uh, 18 sunrises and sunsets in a 24-hour period. Anyway, I like this picture. Because it kind of shows you that. That's one of the one of the things I enjoyed the most during the spacewalk. And if I was able to look, or I was not inside the telescope, but I was you know outside where I could see it coming, you kind of feel the heat coming before it shows up. You can kind of feel the warmth of the sun coming toward you, and then you can look down. You can see the Earth actually rotating. This is a, a photo, but when you're looking at it, the Earth is rotating. So that line of darkness and light is moving across the Earth. It's tracking as the Earth is rotating. And you can kind of see what's going on. You're flying over Los Angeles, and you see here's the sun's coming up over Los Angeles as I'm coming over. You can see that line. It's kind of cool to think of, you know, these people in the dark, these people in the light, and pretty soon the, you can see the dawn coming, and then it's daytime. And it, that whole thing is going on right in front of you as you're doing your, doing your work. It's pretty cool. All right. Uh, here's some video from our space watch. In, uh, in the hat shroud of the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, so that's what my helmet. We have these cameras on our head. Open the doors. And that's my and reason why the doors over the, the fixed head star trackers and the rate sensor units. And now, looking from the opposite uh, helmet cam, this view from Michael Good looking into the telescope at uh, Mike Massimino. So I'm inside. We're here. We're trying to uh, chase out those gyroscopes. I'm handing it to Mike. I've got to be very careful. If I hit anything inside of there, it totally destroys the telescope. So I have to be like a statue and move very, very, very good now. carefully. <laughs> Seating the new brake sensor unit. That might be a special tool that you can feed these things into. We have a good rapid test in RSU 2R. You have a go for RSU 3. Mike is very happy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
and also I changed out the batteries on the telescope. And these are big batteries, they're like the battery modules. And they were the, they were the original batteries that we wanted to tell the telescope in 1998. Take them back to the telescope. Okay, good. Okay, now this is what I was talking about the hand drive at the beginning. The is probably I couldn't get this hand drill off. So here I am trying to test for my helmet camera. So before I could get all the screws out, I had to get this stupid hand drill out of the way. And I just went home with the script. Here's the thing. So they told me just to try to rip the thing off. That was great. Let me try something like about an hour and a half. That's what we're going to do. Then I'm going to do my standard. First, we start off white field camera. Oh, yeah, main objective. Gold one might not come out. You're going to break the drive right. You can't get the hard shoes in. It goes long. Then you're out there and you've got a bar. That you had to break off manually. Right. What's up with is that high tech? No. <laughs> <laughs> what he said at the end there was, is that high tech? No, that's me in my garage. <laughs> yeah, that's what it felt like. You know, I was, I was actually thinking, uh, you know, people ask me, what were you thinking about at different times? But I thought about it that time ripping that hand drill off. I remember when I was a little kid, and uh, I was well, not that, about 10 years old, and uh, then we got some kids about that age here, right? Some big kids. All right. So, and my uncle, I grew up in an Italian neighborhood in New York, and we all had to live near each other because no one else would move in. So my uncle was across the street and around the corner. And so I remember my, my uncle was having trouble getting his uh, oil can, his oil filter off his car. You ever heard the story, Marty? Marty heard these stories, so he can do the presentation. But um, but we was having trouble getting his oil filter off, and uh, he comes across the street, and I'm playing, doing something, I don't know. And he goes, where's your father? I think he's in the house. So he goes, my, my father grew up on a farm, and he had all this old farm equipment. He had the biggest screwdriver I've ever seen in my life. You know, one of these big tractor <laughs> screwdrivers. It's about, you know, three or four feet long. It's a huge screwdriver. And uh, he comes out with that thing, and, he's, and he brings it across the street, and he goes, come with me, maybe you'll learn something. Not knowing he was actually training me to do this. <laughs> so what he did was, I was only 10. He had no idea what I was going to do. He was hoping I would stay out of jail. So, anyway, <laughs> so he, he, bangs the, you know, he bangs the screwdriver down into the, into the filter. And then my uncle grabs a rag and starts, you know, pulling on this thing, whatever, with a rag, and he's cursing and saying stuff. And the you know, oil's screwing up, and he, bang, he finally got that thing to go. So I'm sitting there in the telescope, and I couldn't curse or anything like my uncle did, but I was like, Uncle Frank, this one's for you. <laughs> That's how I trained to do that task. Of course, my uncle was over an oil filter. All right, and so I was very happy after we got, after that, we got that bar out of the way, everything went fine. And uh, we got to repair the instrument, and everything went well. And uh, I got a chance to come to the window and take these, this photo. This photo ended up on the, on the front of the uh, Washington Post. It's, uh, I was very happy at this point. If you took this about four hours earlier, I would not be very happy. <laughs> but I was very happy. And it was the end of my space, uh, that spacewalk, which uh, was my second one, the, the last one I've done. Uh, I had about 20 minutes just to enjoy the view, which was just magnificent. And uh, it was a nice way to end it. Uh, we got everything done after five spacewalks, five days of spacewalking. Uh, we let the telescope go, and uh, I have some video to show you of, uh, of eating. That's eating Megan Harry Walker, who is uh, a flight engineer, and Megan, what are you doing now? Well, we just finished the starboard survey of the orbiter TPS, and I'm not going to get much, so I got this locker here that says MS2 meals on it, yeah. and I put out.
Can anyone tell me what this is? Got it. This is a replica of, oh, okay, they, they, our friend Paolo Nespoli he's actually in space right now. He's an Italian astronaut. Um, he, uh, he's quite a character. And I wanted to fly, so I, I, I come from an Italian background, so I wanted to fly something from Italy. It was also with the 400th anniversary, right, of Galileo, Galileo back in, in 2009. It was the 400th anniversary of making his observations. And uh, it, was, so it was an international uh, a year of astronomy. And, I want, and so it just fit in nicely. Galileo was from Italy. It was this big, you know, we have Hubble, you know, this great telescope in the payload bay. Wouldn't it be nice to, to fly something in recognition of Galileo, who started the whole thing off, observing, right? Again, am I okay? Well, can I not say anything? No blasphemy here? Okay, all right. So we wanted to, so I called my friend Paolo, and sometimes you never know what Paolo was. He was trained all over the world, and I wrote him a note, and I said, you know, I, I, I just emailed him and said, Paolo, I'd like to fly something related to Galileo on a flight. Being here from Italy, I figured he could, you know, figure out something with the Italians. So he writes me back, like within 10 seconds, he goes, Mike, I'm outside the Galileo Museum in Florence right now. I'll come back with something. <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. So I saw him a couple, you know, he comes back a couple weeks later, he goes, I, I, he goes, he goes it's something, we have to, you know, we, we have trouble. They wouldn't give me anything right away. He goes, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a problem. They, they say they give things, they give things out, they never get them back. It's like the Mona Lisa. I'm like, okay. I'm like, they're, 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 So he arranged this for us. They didn't want to give us, in fact, they might have given it to us, but we didn't want the real telescope. But this is an actual replica that had a lot of value anyway. We were nervous enough with this thing. Made from the same uh, Murano glass and, and wood and the whole bit that Galileo's telescope was made from. And they had this as a replica in their museum. But the thing's kind of long and wouldn't fit in our, uh, in our locker. So we had him cut it in half. You see that little seam there? <laughs> Slice the thing in half and put like a screw thing in it so we can screw it together and use it. But yeah, so I'm glad they didn't give us the real one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the point was, you know, this is Galileo's telescope flying and there's Hubble in the background. So I mean, you kind of have both ends of the spectrum. You have the telescope that started it all off and a telescope that's carrying it on today in the same spaceship. So that's, uh, that's that photo. And, uh, after, uh, after spending about two weeks in space, it was time for us to come back. We took uh, our uh, armored suits out again and got inside of them. And this oh, is a video about the way we roll today. Why don't you tell them about what you're going to do? I'm going to be watching Scooter. You're going to be watching Scooter. What are you going to be looking for? Well, I'm going to be looking to see that all the, the milestones as we come around the heading of Iron Cone and make sure he's on 180. Thing, you know, they're coming down. There's no going around. Mm -hmm. They're landing. 
So this is, you want to make sure you've got the right stuff underneath you when you touch that. That's very, very important. Can't say that. I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to be coming down. I'm going to get the right spot.
I had no sensation of movement at all. The strangest thing was just sitting there. It was just like kind of grayish cloud out the window. You know, we were coming out where we couldn't see anything. It was just kind of like gray, like we're flying through a cloud. I had no sensation of movement at all. But I could look at the, you know, our, our velocity indicator. We were going like 12,000 miles an hour. But so the strangest thing is I feel like I'm just like sitting still inside of it. And like, wow, this is really something. I don't even feel like I'm going anywhere. No sensation of, of speed. And we still travel really fast. And then you kind of duck down below that. And you pick up, you pick up the horizon again. And you can see the still see a little curvature of the Earth, and we could. It was a really clear day once we got below that stuff. Uh, it was really clear. We could see California coming, and you get and you're still going really fast, but you know you're you're, you're slowing down, and then you, you get down lower, and we can take up get more detail, and you see you can see the coast, and come right over California and see Edwards from you know, a few miles out, and everything went fine. But it was pretty. It was pretty cool. It was actually I think. I don't know, I've never been on a flight deck for a launch, but I think the, the entry is maybe a little bit more interesting because you get to, as you're, you're, you go slower through the atmosphere, so you get to experience it uh, a little bit more, enjoy it a little bit more than you know, the launch, which happens so quickly. Okay. Why did you decide to become an astronaut? Why did I decide to become an astronaut? Well, uh, when, I was a, when I was a little boy, uh, I watched the astronauts walk on the moon when I was about six years old and thought that was really cool. And uh, that's when I first started dreaming about being an astronaut. I liked math and science in school. And uh, when I went to college, I decided to study engineering because I liked math and science. But it really wasn't until I got out of college and I thought about what I wanted to do that I started thinking about the interest I had in the space program. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't know if I could become an astronaut, but I, I, you know, I figured since I liked the space program, that would be some job that I could do uh, in the space program. And I went to graduate school and, and did some space-related research and then started applying to become an astronaut when I was in grad school. And the more I found out about the job, the more I knew I'd really love it, but I knew it was tough. Uh, it took me a bunch of tries. The first time I applied to NASA, um, they sent me back a letter saying, no, we're not interested. And, and back then, they were taking applications about every two years, so I had to wait two years. And I applied the second time, and they said, no, we're not interested. The third time I applied, I got an interview. Uh, and uh, the interview, it's, it's a week-long interview. They interview about 120 people. So usually about 25 spots or so back then. Now it's become much smaller. But, uh, and then after the interview, I waited and waited, and I got a letter back saying they weren't interested. But I <laughs> applied again a fourth time, and, and I got another interview, and that time I got picked up. So um, yeah, I just knew, I, as I got, I was interested in it when I was a little kid. And as I got older, I knew it was a, a job I really would enjoy doing. And so uh, I, I gave it my best shot and, and stuck with it, didn't give up when he told me no, and got lucky. Yeah. Okay. What's that? We're getting right next to it. Go ahead, buddy. I'm sorry, go ahead. Which misfunctions? Why <laughs> wasn't it working properly? Uh, you talking about like originally? You don't look that old to know all this stuff. You <laughs> 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 got on the, on the flight? The problems I told you about? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, you could blame it on the astronauts, but we don't want to do that. <laughs> um, no, the problem we had with the, like with the bolt that Drew couldn't get to come out, his, his problem that he had with that wrench, I thought we had to get a different wrench and so on, he was stuck out there, my buddy was out there. We think what happened was is uh, when they tightened it up, uh, they replaced that instrument back in 1993. So it was like 16 years before we got there. They had put that instrument in there. And we think that the way that they calibrated the, the, the tool, that, that, that it was a, a torque wrench, which means they want to put the right amount of force torque inside of that bolt. We think that they were using one that allowed them to over tighten it a little bit. So it was an older version of the, the new tool we have and that we just think they over tighten. At least we're blame, trying to blame them for it. <laughs> Jeff Hoffman was like, I have to tell you who it was, it was Jeff Hoffman. Because the never did that. And uh, so we tried to blame them. But we just think it was a little just over tightened a bit. And then the, you know we had trouble getting it out. The the problem I had uh, with with the bolt I had uh, you know, I, I, was, I thought I screwed it up, and I, you know, I probably had something to contribute to it, but what they found was is that those bolts that I was messing with, because they were never supposed to come out, 
and that handrail will have a stand, it will stand a shuttle launch and handling and everything else, that they actually put what they call staking, which is like a glue. So they glued those bolts in here. We knew that they glued them in there, but the amount of force that we thought that was going to take to break that staking and get that bolt out of there was miscalculated. So we, we thought we were up against a screw that would come out more easily than it did, but there was more glue inside of that thing. When we got the handrail back, they looked at it and looked at the bolts, and there was more, more of that glue, the staking they call it, than it was supposed to be there. So that was a surprise to us, and it helped with, contributed to the, to the, to the bolt. And then the other problem I mentioned was briefly was that I was going to put the gyroscopes in, and that, uh, I could not believe that, because they measure these things down really, really precisely, and I, I just could not believe we couldn't get it to fit. But uh, when they got it back, you know, because we returned the one that wasn't fitting, and they found out that it was measuring correctly, a little bit larger than they had ex expected. So, but people make mistakes, and even it's very precise work we're doing, people make mistakes. Years ago. <coughs> for a few years ago, you said. Yeah, they've had a couple. I mean, with, the, with the question from our young friend there, there was when it first was launched, it had a problem with the with the lens was was misshapen, and they had to fix that. And then the gyro we had one of the missions was kind of like a rescue mission because the gyroscope failed, and the thing was in a safe mode and couldn't point anymore, so it was just hanging out, and uh, they had to give it to the gyro. So yeah, they've had. They've had a number of failures over the years. Stuff just breaks after a while. Parts that move wear out. So the gyroscopes, for example, move all the time, and eventually those things are going to wear out. So. You notice he said that several times that they weren't supposed to take this out. They weren't supposed to replace it. They were not supposed to have that. Did they move the five-year mission? Do you remember? I mean, it wasn't supposed to last 20 years. He tried to set that expectation low. <laughs> 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 Yeah, no, you're right. They didn't expect it to last this long. And it's, you know, it's only been over 20 years, hopefully a few more. Our other young friend was trying to answer a question there. Go ahead. How did you and the burrito float around in space? How did what? How did you and the hamburger lunch float around in space? Uh, it's, you got to keep an eye on your lunch. You might float away from it, someone might eat it. <laughs> yeah, everything floats. It's kind of cool. And that's, and you got to get used to that because stuff floats and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. You can lose stuff, too. A lot of stuff gets lost. Luckily, we have a, a, an air filtering system where you know, the air is always being sucked through a filter, and in the morning, we'd wake up and we'd find all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Somebody's watch, uh, you know, gas <laughs> break, all kinds of stuff. It's stuck. Hey, look, who left this over here. So, um, yeah, it's kind of cool having stuff float, actually. Once you get used to it, you know, you can put, a, you can put a, your... Uh, spoon or fork or your food and just leave it there um, once you get brave enough to leave something there and turn your head and come back and it should still be there but you're not always the first but it's kind of fun uh, coming back to earth uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm blaming this on the space experience uh, I was unloading groceries with my wife from the car and I took a bag and floated it <laughs> so that was when she said what are you doing with uh, <laughs> so you gotta also get used to coming back to Earth. You know, after a while, you get used to that stuff. It don't work like that on Earth. A lot of them are probably pretty similar. In fact, we had two uh, two power tools. One was a big one that was developed about twenty years ago uh, that we use for big bolts and. and Large torque amounts for uh, for the task I was doing. They wanted we wanted to in, invent a new one, a, a high speed drill with lower torque that was easy to handle, so I could get tactile feedback. I could feel what was going on a little easier. So we we, we can't, not we. I mean we helped them, but you know the, we had a, an engineering team that developed that, that drill. And that's very much like a a small drill you might find in the in the store. You know the way it, the way it works. You know, like a, you might find a Home Depot. Uh, on the key to one of those small uh, DeWalt drills, kind of about the same size. Um, but in general, the way things are different between space tools and, and 
and, and earth tools. Some are very specialized, but your basic wrench and power tool and so on is, works very similarly to it. Uh, one big difference is that you need to be able to tether it. So all of our tools have a tether point on them because they'll float away. So what we do is we put hooks with you know, strings attached to us or to something else so that the tool won't flow away. So every tool will have a tether point on it. Also, just about every tool will have a bayonet fitting on it, which is a probe more or less that can go into a holder. So we have these little receptacles on our workstations and on our the tool handles, and so we can stow these things. So again, so you got to, you can't, the thing can't float away, so you need a way to stow it and lock it in so it won't float away from you. And then you're working in a huge uh, suit, and it's pressurized, and the gloves are big. It's kind of like, almost like boxing gloves, not that bad, but close, more closer to that than your regular hand. And they're pressurized, so you're, you know, you're, doing, you're closing your hand like a fist, like you would for a screwdriver. That's going to take, that's going to, it's hard to do. You know, you can only do that so often and you're going to fatigue your hands. So, most of the handles we have for all those tools, like we have, whatever we have, we have big handles on them. So that you're able to more easily grab them with your, with your hand. And then, then you get into the power tool, the battery source has to be an approved battery that we use. The electronics have to withstand, you know, the ratings or whatever they need so they can be used in space. But the actual, look at this, some of the things like a crescent wrench. It's just like a crescent wrench we would have on Earth, except it's got a tether point and a big handle on it. Uh, what's the difference between uh, like the practice diving tool and a spacewalk? Uh, the, 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 the tool really gets you ready to do your spacewalk. The mock-ups are not exactly, they, look, they do look exactly like the real ones. They're not to the same tolerance as those, the real telescope, of course. But working with the tools, the choreography, the body positioning, the, you know, the teamwork aspect of it is great, and you, I would felt very well prepared even on the very first spacewalk to do it. Okay. I was more like the overall feel of it. Of the suit? Well, like the weightless versus in the water. Just yeah, and you don't, you don't, you're not weightless in the water. You know, you, you're, um, like, you'll kind of go down in the suit. If you, like, try to stand up in this, you'll float to the bottom of the suit, because gravity's still working on you. Mm -hmm. If you let go of the tool, it's going to go to the bottom of the, of the pool. Unless it's got foam on it or something to keep it floating. So uh, you still you, know, you still fight gravity. They try to they try to put foam and, and other floaty kind of things on our tools so that they don't have as much weight. So you don't have to. It's, it's more like space. But the, the suit is you know has more it has weight to it. And so when you move it around, you're even though they, they make you nuclear buoyant, like you're floating in a pool. So you, they try to they can balance you out so that you are kind of like floating there in a position but you're still working against the, the gravity of the suit. And that aspect of it is much easier in space because you're not working against the suit as much. Um, and you, but you float more. You've got to be a little bit careful because in the pool, you also have the water drag, which actually is your advantage because it'll, it'll slow you down a little bit. In space, you know, just a little push and you're going somewhere. Whereas in the water, you're a lot more stable. So it's kind of like you know, good and bad, the differences. But it does prepare you for it.
But I think there's something more with too. I think there's an you know, exploratory sense of actually sending a person there to observe and see what it's like and experience. You know, we're all are curious about that. So I think there's a practical reason to send people, but I think there's also this kind of exploratory reason that we want to experience it. I sleep, we, uh, we use sleeping bags. Uh, they're kind of more like a sleep, they're more like a bedroll than a sleeping bag. And uh, they have lots of hooks on them. We roll them up in the, in the morning after, we're, after we, you know, we wake up and put them away. And then we take them out at night when we're getting ready to go to bed. They have the hooks, the hooks, what they do is they allow us to, to attach the sleeping bag to whatever it is you want to sleep on. Because you don't want to just climb in your, in your sleeping bag, in your bedroll, and go to bed, because what you'll do is you start to float around, you'll wake up, you'll hit your head, you'll knock into your friends, you'll wake them up. And so we tie the thing down, more or less. But once you get inside, you're still floating, you just won't float away from whatever it is you're attached to. So it's kind of like being on a really cool water bed. You just kind of float there, very, very relaxing. Uh, we have a pillow. And the early astronauts found that um, they got so used to, on Earth, we're so used to sleeping with a pillow behind our head, that they couldn't fall asleep without a pillow. And if they put a pillow behind their head, in space you kind of just, when you start going to sleep, you'll just get, you'll relax, and you kind of come, your, your body will normally just kind of come forward, and your head will come off the pillow when they wake up. So we actually have a piece of cloth that we have that keeps our, the pillow kind of attached to our head. It actually works great. It's a piece of cloth, you know, you usually wear a hat anyway, but it's cold. We try to usually keep it a little bit cooler in the shell, and you get cold at night. So we usually like a sleep hat, and you, have to, and you, wear, you wear a sleep mask, because we, we do keep one or two lights on in case you have to go to the restroom in the middle of the night. And you wear earplugs because there's background noise and fans and so on, and people. So you uh, put earplugs in. And, and it, I found it tough to go to sleep the first couple nights, I think just because we were getting ready for the spacewalks and everything, but I slept a lot better for the other missions both times. Do you have any religious experience while in the space and looking at the immensity of the void and uh, Yeah, I had, you know, the, the thing that, I guess, it, you know, it's funny, again, what goes through your mind, you know, when you're looking at some of this stuff, and uh, I, I guess the closest thing I came to bringing religion into it, what I felt like was uh, one of the times that I was looking at the Earth for my spacewalk, um, you know, as, as a, you know, I'm a, I'm a dad, my kids are now getting older, they're both in high school now. But, you know, as a dad, you try to you try to have a nice house for your kids, you know, and make it, everything nice, right, Marty? You know, you're, that, you're always trying to make the place nice for the kids, you know, paint the kids' room, put up their swing set in the backyard, whatever you need to do, you're trying to make the house nice, right? You want your kids to have a nice place to live. And um, when I looked at the earth, you know, the times I've looked at the earth of how beautiful it is, during one of the passes, I thought about that as, as from, to bring religion into it or in some way. Was, you know, I, in, from, I, you know, I, have to, I believe in God, and I was thinking, you know, God the Father, how much he must love us to give us such a beautiful home. Because it really is the most beautiful thing that I've ever seen. So that was probably the closest thing that I came to to, a, to someone of a, a religious experience. That, and during that spacewalk when I had to break off that handrail, I thought there was no way it was going to happen. I said more prayers than I could <laughs> that was, I was doing everything this morning. I was even going into Hebrew there for a while. I was to, and it was a Sunday, you know, and I'm, I'm Catholic. So I was like, all right, I'm not at church, but I'm doing more prayers than I ever did on any Sunday ever. So I, I, was, I, was, I was doing everything. If I had a rosary, I would be saying it right there. So, but, that, you know, I think there is, there is somewhat of a, you know, spiritual um, element to this whole thing. You know, and... Uh, you know, looking at the earth and looking at the stars and seeing all that stuff out there is, is pretty amazing. And I would, I would definitely, for me, I would classify it as spiritual and, and in some ways religious. And that was you know, one example of some of the thoughts I had. One more question. I'll pick up that young man. Uh, me? Uh, wait. Um, I, as a question, uh, I imagine, you know, when you're, when you're in space, there's, there's a lot of precision that goes into place. There's a lot of discipline. You know, everything's scheduled. Um... And I'm sure y'all are used to dealing with high-pressure situations that would probably stress uh, some other people out. Other than a sense of humor, um, what aspects of training or, or personality or strategies are used to, to, to deal with those situations? 
where one mistake could could have a high cost. I, I think uh, what it does is it forces you into a team, a team situation. Because there's no one person that can fly a space mission on his own, or her own. And it really forces you into a team situation. And uh, I think it brings out the best in people because you realize that there's no way ever, there's no way you can succeed at doing your job without all of your crewmates and lots of people on the ground helping you out. So uh, the, the team concept is really important. And the individual who is going to be looking out for themselves is uh, going to be a problem. So really the only way to, to solve all these problems is, is teamwork. You know, when I couldn't get that handrail off, there's no way I would have come up with it. You know, as though it seemed pretty simple, just pull it off. What happened was is when we got into that situation, we had a whole team on the ground uh, helping us. There was a bunch of people in Houston, and there were people all over the country helping us out, all over the world, really. And there was a group of engineers that we worked with that trained us that were still at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, which is where they, where they managed the servicing of the telescope. And uh, they had a mock-up of our of all of our instruments there in their control center. And what they did was they realized the problem I was having. Now this is while I'm in space on a Sunday, right? All this is going on. And these guys are there ready to help us. What they did is they removed the bolts that I was able to remove and they put the one, they left that one bolt on a handrail and they were looking at the instrument saying, how the heck can Mike get this thing off? All right, this is going on where we're trying to figure this out with the team in Houston. And this one guy, James Cooper, uh, this young engineer that, that I know well who worked with us had the idea, can he just rip the thing off? Now, it sounds simple, but it never crossed my mind. We were looking at trying to remove the base plate and do all kinds of stuff, but he just had the idea, can we just pull it off? So he set up, you know, they, they set up a scale for this thing and they pulled it off and measured how much force it was going to take. It was about 60 pounds of force linear to pull the thing off. They thought they figured out to do that. They radioed that into the team in, in Houston as, as quickly as they could. We went to the front room of our control center to our flight director. He said, give it a try. And I heard my friend Dan Burbank, who was the astronaut on the ground, was kept on radio that up. So the question was, what aspects are we looking at? I think the, team, the teamwork aspect is the most important thing. You know, you know, realizing that you, you know, your success is going to be measured as a team, not as an individual. And the, the bond and the friendship you have with those people is, is a really good one. So yeah, I, you know, that is, I don't know how to explain it any further. I mean, it's kind of going for a long time maybe, but you know, that's that I think is a is a really important attribute. Yeah. That's, I think it's a very that's a very good example. What was the coolest thing? Uh, the spacewalks were just amazing. Getting a chance to go out there and do that and. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll finish with another another story that I've told several times before, but not not here today, so I'll tell it now. And that was, you know, looking at the Earth, what I what I thought of on my second spacewalk, uh, when I really had a chance. My first spacewalk, I didn't. My first flight, I didn't really look around. I was afraid of getting distracted. But on my second spacewalk, I had time to really look. And uh, my first glance at the Earth, I was in a foot restraint. I could really look at it, and you know, I wasn't looking through the window of the space shuttle anymore. I was just looking through the bubble of my tongue. So I could see the Earth in its entirety. It's still big, it takes you to the whole field of view. But you can see the curvature, you can see it as a planet in front of you. And uh, you know, the thought I had was, uh, don't look at it. I actually turned my head. I said, this is too beautiful. People aren't supposed to see this. I was turning your head. And then I looked again. And uh, I, just, I just started to get overcome with the, with the beauty of what I was seeing. And I started to tear up a little bit. And uh, I got Im immediately got really worried because if I were to introduce water into my spacesuit, I could short something out or cause a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is what I was thinking. It's like, you know, then I have to admit that I was crying. <laughs> but I got, I got myself under control again. And the, you know, the, uh, the third time I looked, the thought that went to my mind was, um, if you were in heaven, this is what you would see. You know, this is how we must look like from heaven. This is how, what our planet looks like from heaven. And then the, uh, the thought that replaced that was not on us, more beautiful than that, this is what heaven must look like. And that's why I felt like I was looking at the paradise. So that was, that was probably the most memorable moment of my life. I mean, other than my, you know, in my professional life. Right? My personal life, I've had a lot of good things to remember too, but, uh, but for my professional life, that, that was it. So
So that, to me, that was the most meaningful, the most fun part, was getting a chance to, to do the Earth.